All right, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to the book of Genesis this morning, please. Chapter number 9, if you'd like to stand as we open the infallible book. If it's not infallible, throw it in the garbage can and go home. Genesis chapter number 9 and verse number 8. A lot of people don't believe this. They believe Noah was a myth. They believe Adam was a myth. They believe the Bible's full of myths. But in Genesis chapter number 9 and verse number 8, the text says, And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you of the fowl of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud. That it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. That it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, and that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Father, bless this book. In Jesus' name, Amen. You can be seated. Now folks, I'm going to do something this morning I've never done before. At uh, anywhere. This will be a first. Uh, God told me plainly what to do, so I'm going to do it. I'm preaching to myself today. Now you can listen if you want to. Join right in. Fine. But this message is for me. And I'm going to ask God to give me what me needs to hear. This morning when I preach God's blessed Word. So I'm preaching to me. And you can listen. In Genesis chapter number 9 and verse number 15, I want you to notice what it said. I will remember my covenant. God's got a good memory. He's got a real good memory. He's got a good memory. Now there's some things that he's forgotten. He intentionally forgets them, else he'd always remember them. He forgot my sins. He forgot all about them, believe me. They're all forgotten. Hallelujah. But he's got a good memory. He told Noah, he said, I'm going to remember my covenant that I made between me and you. That covenant was made as God Almighty bound Himself to His Word and to mankind that He made. For He almost wiped them from the face of the earth. That flood covered everything on this earth, including that 29,000, whatever feet it is, to the top of Everest. Nothing upon the face of the earth escaped that universal flood. God Almighty wiped away everything that had the breath of life in it from planet earth. All mankind that He'd made. They here one day and gone the next. Save eight souls. These eight souls went from an old world into a new world. And then God gave them a covenant. This covenant is bound upon its character. When God deals with mankind, He deals with them upon its character. Now people will let you down. People will lie to you. People will fail you. People will, mis will mistake you and misunderstand you. And people will always, always disappoint you if you elevate them too highly. But the Lord God Almighty will never fail you. He said, My covenant is established in the clouds. And when you see that bow, know for certain that I have established my covenant with you and that my friend was thousands of years ago. And I've seen the bow in the cloud. So my friend, His Word is true. When God says He's going to do something, He's going to do exactly what He said He's going to do. And my friend, He had a covenant with Noah that extends down to me to this day. And when I see that bow outside, I say, Lord, I know there was a universal flood. I believe the Bible. I know what happened. And that bow in the cloud, in other words, the rainbow, 
that has been taken and perverted to be used as some sort of a symbol of perversion. Listen, friend, the rainbow and the cloud has absolutely nothing to do with perversion. It was here long before they showed up, and it'll be here long after they're gone. That rainbow is a beautiful signal and sign of God Almighty's faithfulness. He'll never destroy the earth again with water. In the book of Genesis, chapter number 21 and verse number 1, the Bible said, The Lord visited Sarah as He had said. And the Lord did to Sarah as He had spoken. I like the way it says it here. It says, as He has said. They were laughing about it. They were mocking Him. They were making fun of it. They were talking about the fact they were too old. They were judging the ability of God to perform by physical attribute. By your ability to do it. God doesn't need you. He doesn't need anything you have. He got along a long time before you ever showed up. He'll get along a long time after you're long gone. The Bible said here he remembered what he had said to Sarah. Had he not said it, will he not do it? Look carefully. As he had said. The Bible calls your attention to the fact that when the Word goes forth from the mouth of the Almighty, His Word can be believed. I believe the Bible... I believe it from Genesis to Revelation. I believe every word in this Bible. I say to God this morning, Lord, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. When I come up short, when I fail, when my human ability doesn't match up to the standard of righteousness and holiness of the Word of God, I say, God, help me. And I say to her, Sarah laughed and she made fun. But she wasn't laughing when Isaac was born. She wasn't making fun when this little boy came into the world. Wait, my friend, this day upon the one who said he would do what he would do. In the book of Exodus, chapter number 2 and verse 24, the Bible said, God remembered His covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. That covenant was over 500 years old. It had been a long time since the Almighty had made that covenant with Abraham and said, No, of a surety that your strength, that your people, your seed will be strangers in a land that they know not. But He said in the fourth generation, I will come and I will deliver them. Did He do that? Did He deliver them? Did He do exactly what He said He would do? Was He faithful to His Word? Yes, He was. The Bible said He remembered the covenant that He had made with Abraham. Has God ever made a covenant with you? Have you ever met Him alone with Him? Have you ever opened up your heart and talked to Him face to face, heart to heart, soul to soul, person to person? Have you ever one time in your life said, my friend, get down from your high horse and quit blaming God and making excuses and start talking to Him. And my friend, you'd be amazed. I did. I talked to Him. I talked to Him this morning. I talked to Him last night. I talked to Him all day yesterday. I could feel the power of God in my soul all day long yesterday. I knew people were praying for this preacher. I knew you were. I know you realize what a spiritual battle is going on. And the tactics of Satan are to destroy your faith. He's coming after your faith. He's coming after your faith. He doesn't come after your flesh. If your flesh is not the problem, He comes after your faith. And He wants to destroy what you believe. And if He can destroy your faith, you're finished, friend. For we are people of faith. Faith is our foundation. It's what we believe in Him. Have you talked to Him? In the book of Exodus chapter number 2, He said, God remembered His coming with Abraham. I like that. I like that. In the book of Exodus, chapter number 34, and verse number 6, the Bible said, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, Lord Jehovah, the Lord Jehovah, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and mercy. I want you to ask yourself this question this morning while this preacher is preaching to you. Do you find fault in that statement? Or is that statement true? If you've given Him your life, if you've trusted Him with your fortune, with your faith, with your future, with everything that matters to you, has He been true? Has He been faithful? Has He really... Has He really been true and faithful? I want you to understand something today. This church is packed out on Sunday morning. We pull out chairs for people to sit in. 
so they can come and hear the Word of God. But the finances of this church are going downhill. We can't even pay our bills. I say to some of you that need to hear me real good, listen to what this preacher's saying to you. If you've been tied into God the way you should, if you've been giving to Him of your life and your livelihood, you can expect Him to bless that. You will be blessed. He will bless you. He will bless you. He has blessed me far above and beyond all that I could ask or think. He's been good to me. I can look back over my life. I can say to you right now, every stitch of clothing I've got on my back, everything I live in and hold dear that I have on this earth, my friend, He gave me. He blessed me. But some of you expect God to bless you. And you don't do your part. You don't put anything in that place. It's a shame that a church this big cannot pay its bills. There's a big problem going on. And I've been praying to God. I said, Lord, tell me how to say this. Show me the right way to say this. And when to say this. And so I'm saying it to you right now. When I talk about the faithfulness of God, I'm talking about one who's faithful, friend. Are you faithful? If you're faithful where He's faithful, you will never want. You will never find yourself where you are cast out on the side as a beggar. It will not happen to the saint of God. There's something somewhere that's not right. And we need to find out what it is. So I encourage you this morning to bring the first fruits of your offerings unto the Lord God and let Him bless it. And when He has blessed it, I don't want your money. I'm no, I'm, no, I'm no television evangelist, rich preacher. I want no part of that. I don't have a private jet. I don't fly around like some of these people do. I have nothing but contempt for that crowd. I'm not a multi-millionaire like that crowd out there in California that had the TVN network. I'm not a multi-millionaire. I have nothing but contempt for a crowd like that. I'm not enriching myself off of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No way, my friend. Not this day. But He's been good to me. He's blessed me. And the blessings of God are all can't be counted on what's in my pocket or what I have right now. The blessing of God has to do with me walking down that aisle, out that back door today, and the world that I walk into. The future it holds for me. What tomorrow holds. The next day. The next day. That's the blessing of God. When I begin to think about what God Almighty is able to give me and do for me above and beyond all that I could ask or think, I say, praise God, I've been blessed. God's been good to me. Amen. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 9 and verse number 5, I want you to look at this carefully. No, not for thy righteousness or for the righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, and that He may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I marvel at the fact that the Almighty says, I will dispossess them from what they have to give to you. I will move them from where they are so that you might take what they have. God's a good God. When you start preaching like that to people today, they think, why, you're crazy, preacher. No, let me tell you something. That flag right there flies because God has blessed this country. If God Almighty had not blessed this nation, that flag wouldn't be there right now. I want you to understand something today. It is because of the Lord God Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that we sing the national anthem, that we can sing songs up here in the choir. It's because He has dispossessed so that you can possess. He's been very good to us. Very good to us. Very good to us. He will take care of those that belong to Him. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 32 and verse 4, He said, He is the rock. His work is, his work is perfect. For all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is He. What's a rock for? A rock is a sign. It's a signature. It's a monument. It's something raised up so that others might see. It's what we stand on when people watch you that don't necessarily know much about you. They're watching how you live on your rock. They're seeing how you stand on your rock. 
It's not what you say in here that matters. It's how you live out there. That's when you're screaming to the top of your lungs about what you are. If you rock, can't, fo- can't follow you outside this house. You've got no rock. If your rock can't affect the life that you live, you've got no rock. You've got a bunch of stuff in your head that has no meaning in your life. There's a world full of people that have no faith. They have no light. They have no life. They don't know whether they're here or there. They have no idea why they're here. And they're watching, looking, tasting, telling, smelling, searching for some kind of truth. Is there any truth? Let me ask you a question to say. If this God that you serve, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is He real? Is He really real? Some of you ain't sure. Some of you don't know. You just know you're a Baptist. You just know you come to church on Sunday. You just know you sing in a choir. You just know you're part of a religion. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not alive in every moment of my life, in every place I put my foot, in everything that I undertake to do, He's no God at all. He's either God Almighty or He's no God at all. Jesus is either everything or He's nothing. Amen. And so my friend, do you want to know what killed America? Do you want to know what sucked the very life out of our country? It's dead churches and dead Christians and hypocrite professions. No power. Just my friend a put on a cream puff, a facade. But there's no real life inside the working of the church. I wonder if that's happened at Temple. I wonder if that's happened here. I wonder if it's just a lot of noise in here and no real life. Let me tell you something about your offering. When you put your money in the plate, you're putting your life in the plate. You're saying to the Lord, God, I work for this, but you bless me with it. You're saying to God, I want you to have back what you gave me. I want to be able to make more and feed my family. You're saying, God, I trust you. And you know how necessary money is to pay bills. And you call on His name. And you say, I'm going to put this here. And I know you're going to bless it. And I know you're going to give it back. And when He blesses it, He'll give it back a hundredfold. A thousandfold. Ten thousand fold. But I swear I tell you today, the church is full of mouths, professions, but no power. And the power goes out when the truth goes out. And that's what's happened to us. In the book of Joshua chapter number 23 and verse 14. He said, Behold this day, I am going the way of all the earth. And you know in your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed. Of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. I'm 65 years old. That will be this coming Saturday. Saturday's the 17th day of September. When I started working, I was no more than 14, 14, 13, 14 years old. I got a social security card. I started mixing mud and carrying block. None of you bricklayers and block masons in here, you know what I was doing. I was mixing mud. My my uncle was a bricklayer. More mud. More mud. Every time I turned around, he wanted his mud. So I had to keep it mixed up in a wheelbarrow. I mixed sand and I mixed cement together and poured water. I used a hole that big with two big holes in it. And I pulled it through that. And I made his mud for him. And I got that mud up to him. He paid me something like a dollar, a dollar and a quarter an hour. Back then, that's good money for hard labor. By a dollar, dollar, quarter of an hour, I started paying Social Security. I started paying Social Security. I've been paying it for 50 years. I've been paying Social Security. I'm listening to politicians now as they talk about entitlements. I don't know what they're talking about. I paid long ago for every dime that's been put in to the Federal Treasury. If you've paid interest back to me on that money that's been paid all these years, my friend, you'd understand there'd be a pile of it up there. Ain't giving me nothing. I'm not asking for a handout. And the rest of you people in here, you're just like me. You've been paying into that thing a long time. But a few years back, they changed the story. They changed the game. They said, now you've got to be 66 
before you can get your social security, your full draw of social security. And that happened to come down on me. Do you know what happened? I'll tell you what happened, okay? Let me spell it out to you. The federal government lied to me when I started paying social security. They lied to me when I and you were sick. And you understand this. I'm talking about their faithfulness compared to the faithfulness of God. The, 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 the governor of Texas, Rick Perry, just said that Social Security is a Ponzi scheme. And it may very well be. But you need to get something straight today. There are millions of people in this country just like me, turning 65 and 66, that have worked for 50 years and paid into Social Security while politicians dipped into it and used it for this and used it for everything under the sun. They didn't tell you about that. And my friend today, am I disappointed in my government? Am I disappointed in Social Security? No, friend, I ain't disappointed because I never was appointed. Amen. I don't trust the government as far as I can throw them. Amen. Anything they do for you, they've got one arm tied behind their back and somebody on their neck. They're forced into doing it to you. And I want to tell you something 20 years old and 30 years old and 40 years old right now. You'd better not put your trust in man either. Put your trust in God. Not one thing has ever failed of the blessing He said He'd give me. Not one time did He ever back up when He said it'd be. Yes, sir! How would you understand? They failed me. They failed me. But He never failed me. Hallelujah. Never fail. He never has failed. And He never will fail. Amen. 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 I marvel at the way these politicians throw the word entitlement around. Like it's something that they're giving us. They're not giving you a dime. Not one red cent. I've been given to them for 50 years. Amen. How many is in this house around my age? Old, worn out, 65 years old. Amen. You know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Kind of gives you a warm feeling, doesn't it? You know how good they are. Amen. <laughs> yeah, buddy. <laughs> in First Chronicles chapter number 17, verse 27. No, it says in Ezra, chapter number 9, verse 9. It says, For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> If you only realize this morning where it brought you from and the bondage it brought you out of. And some of you are not completely out of your bondage yet, but you've seen something much better. He's given you a taste of the world to come. That's the way the Holy Ghost does. He'll give you a while of power and glory. He'll touch you with that spirit from on high. And think, my friend, think, 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 think. He's showing you how much better your life can be than what it is. Live for Him. Follow Him. Pray to Him. Seek His face. Read his Bible and come to the house of God and you'll make a change in your life. Amen. Some of you treat God like you do your local grocery store or Starbucks or something. You go in and say, well, I want what's on sale today. And give me whatever fast food's on the market. Well, my friend, God's not like that. You don't push a button and he doesn't pop. He's not, he's not, here, to, he's not, here, to, he's not here to satisfy every little whim you have. He's the Lord God. Amen. If you doesn't try your faith, you got no faith. He doesn't try what doesn't exist. Psalm 89, verse 14. Judgment and justice are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. I like Psalm 12, 121, verse 4. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Amen. Isaiah 49, 16. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Amen. Thy walls are continually before me. Amen. My goodness. Amen. And how stupid was I to think that I was going through this alone. Amen. How foolish was this preacher to think that God had forsaken me. And that the dark days, as dark as they got, that he was nowhere to be found. He was there. Amen. It's just that you need to seek him and search him out. A little deeper, a little harder, a little more personal, a little more gracious. In Luke chapter 1, verse 68, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He hath visited and redeemed His people. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13, For when God made promise to Abraham, I like this, 
Oh, how I like, I like this. When God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Oh, boy. If you don't understand that, you don't have to have a degree in theology to understand that. <laughs> if I swore by you, then I put the oath and the fulfillment of it and the carrying forth of it on you. So he swore by himself. There is no greater. Brother Lee, if he says, by my name, I'll do it. And it's going to get done. You can count on that. He swears by himself, not by another. Because there's another greater. None whatsoever. He said in Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Did you say that, Lord? Did you say that you cannot lie? Did you say it's impossible for you to lie? Did you say you couldn't lie if you tried to? That word impossible is a big word in the English language. I've noticed something about this generation, 2011. They throw big, heavy-duty English words around with, 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 with shallow meaning. I've watched them. Haven't you been conscious of that? Some English words are shallow, but some of them are heavy-duty. And that English word, when it says impossible, that's what it means. Impossible. That means there's no possibility. It's outside the realm of, of possibility. It cannot happen. He cannot lie. Boy, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to give you a few of his names and I'm going to close. <clears throat> He's called Almighty God. What's that mean? Well, that means He's Almighty to the devil. That means He's Almighty to the world. That means He's Almighty to the world system. That means He's Almighty to take care of every need I have in my life. He's Almighty God. Almighty. And when you get home this afternoon, turn to Revelation 1.8 and you'll see who He is. The Almighty. He's Almighty God. Not only that, He's the Holy One of Israel. What's that mean? That means the closer you get to God, the further you get away from the world. Immediate result of walking with God is to walk less in the world. When Enoch walked with God, the Bible said he walked with Him 300 years and God took him. He walked with Him. He walked with God and was no more. For God took him. This world walks in darkness. He's light. So the Holy One of Israel, holy means to pull aside, draw aside, draw aside into Him. We're way too inundated. We're way too just literally, literally, uh, just, just, just like a, like a, like a waterfall, just like Niagara, just pouring down upon us every kind of a diversion possible. And there's no time for God. And then He's the Jehovah that keeps covenants. He's not Yahweh. Last few days I've done quite a bit of digging into Yahweh and Jehovah. I always believed Jehovah. Knew why I believed Jehovah. I got on the internet and I typed this simple term in. I said, how do you pronounce Yahweh? <laughs> Boy, you talk about hanging them. Lord. <laughs> they don't know how to handle it. So what are you talking about, Preacher. I'm talking about anybody that gets up and starts telling you the name of God is Yahweh. He doesn't believe that Bible you got in your hand, number one. Because that Bible uses the term Jehovah. Number two, he believes your Bible's full of errors and mistakes. Number three, he's following what somebody else said. He didn't do any research into it himself. Because if he ever did, he'd find out that there's far more authority for saving, saying Jehovah from Masoretic vowel points than Yahweh from nothing. I got on the internet and I said, how do you pronounce Yahweh? One said, well, it's this way. He went off in this direction. Another one went off in this direction. Another one went off in that direction. Another one went off this way. Another one said, well, that's the way I heard it said. <laughs> that's what most Christianity is. That's what I've always heard. Yahweh doesn't exist. Jehovah is the covenant-keeping God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jehovah means God Almighty will save. Jehovah saves. Yahuwah. And in English, we have J, one of the few languages that has a J. We say, Yah, Yah, Yahovah, Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah. That's His name, not Yahweh. And then, He is the I Am that I Am. The ever-present, ever-existing One. I Am that I Am. I Am that I Am. Wednesday night, I poured my heart out to you, about heartbroken. Wednesday night, I was about at the end of my rope. Wednesday night I'd seen so much of this stuff you're talking about. 
because I've never seen it like that before. You don't have any. You, a lot of most of you don't have any idea how much heartbreak is in this world when they rip families apart. They're ripped apart. I couldn't handle it. Couldn't handle it. But God Almighty said, "Now, son, you're going to have a ministry you didn't have before." I'm talking to you like I never talked to you before because now I got your attention in an area you didn't know anything about and I didn't. And so instead of rejecting him and getting mad at God and stuffing up and stomping out, I said, all right, Lord, teach me. Show me. I believe if I was 35 years old, I'd get me a degree in law. You can you preach and be a lawyer. Hey, don't look so shocked. I know lawyers that are saved. There's one sitting in this house right now, born again. You can be a lawyer and be saved. Granted, I lost a lot of lawyers. Ain't worth a thing. But I'd think about getting a degree in law. Why? Because you can help people. The day of knocking on doors and reaching people is just about on. Long gone, folks. Long gone. But there are countless thousands of ways to reach people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Countless thousands of ways. And an attorney, has a, he, has a, he has an open door because he deals with people when they're in problems, when they're, in, when they're hurting, a lot of times very vulnerable. And it's a time like that that his message, his or her message, can get over. They're ready. They're willing to receive it. They're re- willing to hear it. Did you hear what this lady said a moment ago that this family moved out of here and went to South Carolina? Down there a week and the husband left the family? Did you catch that? And now, they're, now the family sta- is staying in her house, staying with her. And she's trying to show them Christian love and compassion. That's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. That's visitation she's doing right now. Amen. She goes to visitation every day when she goes home. That's visitation. That's... Uh, Evangelism. That's evangelism. You don't always have to do the, the, the thing the same way through generation after generation after generation. Years ago, churches had buses. God forbid I'd ever criticize a bus. So much good had been done with bus ministries. Preachers in the pulpit now, missionaries on the field, came straight off of the bus ministry. Thank God for it. But it doesn't mean every church has to do it. And it doesn't mean it'll always be the same through that generation after generation. What would God have Temple Baptist Church do? What can we do? What can we do to reach people? We're on television Sunday morning, Wednesday night, Saturday night. TV's expensive, but it's reaching people. You, you, look, you log into our website, you get on that prayer page I've got, and you'll look at a page as long as from here to the front of that building out there. If you run all the way down that prayer page. Our prayer requests are coming in now at least three times as much as they used to, just no more than six months. I don't know what's happened. All of a sudden, it's just exploded. I'm getting prayer requests from everywhere. People are on that web page. They're watching the archive videos. They're watching us live. I logged on. Yes, I logged on last week. We had 800 hits. 800 people. 800 logged on to the Lion of Judah last Sunday to watch what's going on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Sunday school. That's far more that's in this house right now. And then during the week, all those, arc, those videos and audios are archived. They can log on. And I keep a, kind of try to keep a record. They're coming. Folks, they're coming on there. I put a counter. That all it does is just counts every time the front page is hit. And I put a counter on the front page of the Lion of Judah. It's been on there now for about a month and a half. I've got over 8,000 hits in a month and a half. God's blessing it. It's reaching people. But that stuff costs money. That costs money. We've got a dedicated server. I fooled around with the internet, got so sick and tired of messing around with go home at Sunday night and try to get on our web page and they're just dragging. You try to lock up and pull up something, they're just dragging. And the reason for that is because it's a shared it's shared resources. The server can only handle so many web pages. So now we've got a dedicated server. We're the only one on that server. You should never put, log on to the line of Judah and have it drag when you want to, when you want to get on there. You shouldn't do that. Now, people are coming. They send emails. They're watching the web. They're watching the Internet. 
We've got a live feed right now. People are listening to me right now in Aruba, Russia, all over the world. They're logged on watching Temple Baptist Church. It takes money to do that. It takes money. I don't believe God's going to do anything with this church. I'll just be as honest as I can with you. I don't believe He's going to do any more with us. I believe we're as far as we're going until this church gets right with God. And that's a sure sign right there. Right there. If you could just see what God has done and what He will do with Temple Baptist Church. Father, I've said all I can say. I've done what You told me to do. I preached to myself, Lord, and then I'm, I messed up and started preaching to them. But I believe You'll forgive me for it. God, we pray. Use it for the glory of God. We need You, Lord. We need You in here. Father, we have too many people in this house that are just, they're just riders, and they're not part of what's going on. They just ride. They get on and take a free ride. And as long as they do that, it'll never mean anything to them. It'll never really mean anything. As long as they take free rides, it won't. It's when they invest themselves in it and their money in it and they become part of it. It'll mean something to them then. In Jesus' name. We've got a lady in here I prayed with last week. This lady right here has been, has been uh, they've diagnosed her with breast cancer. And I prayed with her the other night. She lives up in, uh, in uh, Jamestown, up in uh, Cumberland County, in that area up in there. And she get, passed me a note this morning and asked me to pray with her and anoint her with oil in the name of the Lord. And I'd like for some of you all, if, you, if you'd like to come down here with me this morning, I don't, I'm not sure I know who you are, ma'am. But